And, and what's up, everybody? What's up, everybody? Welcome, Welcome to, the to the Smoke and Tobacco Show. I'm Matt Tobacco from SmokingTobacco.com. I am joined once again with my friend, Mr. John Carney. And tonight, we want to welcome on our special guest, Mr. Terrence Riley from Aganor Salif. Terrence, welcome to the show. John, how are you? Good evening, Thank gentlemen. It's live, live from uh, Florida, Massachusetts, and Maine. It's Thursday night. Yeah, it is Thursday night. Terrence, how are you, buddy? Thanks for joining us. Oh, thank you for having me. I'm just living the dream, as always. What a combo. Maine, Massachusetts, and Florida. I love it. Yeah. Yeah. We're really spread, really out, spread here. out here. Yeah. And, uh, but, you know, we, but, you know, we, we, we do the best with what we have. And, uh, and uh, so far, it's, it's, gone, it's gone really well. Gone really well. Um, um, we're so glad, we're so glad you could join us. Tonight, I'm going tonight, to be smoking the Agonor Salif Supreme Leaf that just came out recently. I'm going to get into that in a little bit. John, what are you smoking over there? I actually, coincidentally, I smoked my Agonorsa collection. I had one cigar of Agonorsa up here in Maine in my humidor. Um, I smoked it two weeks ago and actually sent a picture of it to Terrence. Ah, and I, ah. I smoked the Agonorsa Connecticut. Uh, so tonight I'm going to be smoking this crooked uh, Airbender Chisel Maduro that I had in my pocket when I was at the gym and sat on it when I was in my truck. So I'm smoking a crooked Chisel Maduro. We're going to see how the performance is on it. One of the reasons I like to do this is I like to put my cigars in extreme circumstances. So if we ever have an issue with a cigar from one of our customers and they complain about it, I can say, well, I had mine in my pocket and it had no issues with it. And I sat on it. It didn't even crack. What have you been doing with it? Yeah, I mean, that's, you know, I, when I first saw it. I thought maybe it was a production issue at LFD and I got a little concerned. But, you know, it turns out it was just user error. So thank God for that. Um, Terrence, what are you smoking over there, bud? I got that Aganor Sleep Connecticut that uh, John had a couple weeks ago, and uh, it's smoking deliciously right now. I have to say, one thing about that—that that was one of the first cigars I ever smoked when I got into cigar smoking uh, a couple years ago, and it's always been one of my, especially the Connecticut. It's always been one of my favorites, um, especially one of my favorite Connecticut shades. It's just such a great cigar, real smooth, creamy. I, it, I it's one of my go-to Connecticuts. Um, big fan of the Aganor Sleep line myself. Smoke a lot of that stuff. Um, including the JFR stuff, Guardian of the Farm. Really, really great collection you have over there. It's fantastic. Uh, tonight, like I said, I'm smoking the Supreme Leaf. I'm really excited about it. I actually haven't had this one yet. This is going to be my first smoke with this. Um, but taking it out of the cellophane, I'm looking at it. It's different. I like that band, real brightly, the yellow, orange, and purple. I'm going to put that right up there. A lot Very of bright colors. colors. Yeah. yeah, very vibrant. It really it really pops, you know, and uh, the it's just very eye-catching. Um, closed foot right there on the end. There's a nice closed foot on it, which I like. I like a good cigar with a, with a closed foot. Uh, I think it definitely adds a lot of character to it. But I'm going to go ahead and cut it and light it up. There we go. Fantastic cigar. So this cigar, uh, as I said before, it came out recently. This is a, this is a Nicaraguan Puro. And it's a five and a half by 52 Robusto. MSRP is 9.95. A box of 10 will send you back 99.50. And so, Terrence, I was reading this cigar was actually released uh, in 500 boxes, but it's not a limited run. Is that so correct? the so the first run uh, was in January. It was 500 boxes of a Robusto size, and uh, we just did a <laughs> secondary release of a Toro size in 1,500 boxes. Um, and it's what we call an allotment release. We do that with our uh, Agonorsa signature lines as well. But basically, they come out a couple times a year. Um, and it, in this case, some of the tobaccos we use, we, we grow a lot of tobacco. We, we produce about now, I think it's up to 17,000 bales a year, which is a lot of tobacco. Uh, but certain farms, certain lots, certain fields, uh, we, we use for a lot of different things. And so we, we have to make sure that we have production for the tobacco from those particular regions and areas. Um, and, and this, uh, the Supreme leaf uses some of those tobaccos in it. So it's, it's kind of limited to the degree that, that we need to make sure we're fulfilling our, our regular production of other projects for ourselves and others using that tobacco. And then we, that we have enough left to, uh, to produce. And so we make as many as we can and ship it a couple times a year. Yeah. This cigar, I just lit it up. Like I said, I mentioned that closed foot before, and you taste it right away. You taste that wrapper right on there. A little bit of a blast right up front, and it's great. Um, it's I, I get a little bit of a pepper note, that little bit of spice there. Um, it, get a little bit of character right off the bat, and I, I love it. It's uh, it's different, and it smokes really well. Great construction on this cigar. Um, I have to say, great a great construction and a good draw. Nice and loose. Just put on as I as I this. Yeah, that, that one's very rich. I like, I can't 
from there, but the Connecticut smoking, we tend to usually do like a sauce, which I prefer than the really hardcore crust, only because uh, it's it, it just allows that nice easy draw. And, and and I like a box press to begin with, so you get the the benefits of the box press, <clears throat> but at the same time, uh, you're still getting really good airflow and, and draw. Yeah, it does have that, that soft press on it, and I do like that myself. When I come across a good stick that has a nice soft press, I agree, it has a, it has a good draw on it still. Um, so yeah, I'm enjoying this cigar, and I'm excited to get all the way through it just to see how it changes and you know and how it burns and all that. It's so far it's great, and I, and I'm and I'm only just lit. So, um, like I said, great cigar so far. I got to get more of these. I got to get a whole box. Um, it's, wow. it's probably the greatest night of our lives. Yeah, it's it's oh it's fantastic. <laughs> this is gonna be the best night ever. Um, it's uh it's definitely gonna be a good show. We have a lot in store. We have uh, Carney's here with me again, and he'll have a soap review later in the show. Um, can't wait for as, that. Yeah, I know. This, this is it's a it's a mystery soap review tonight. I do not know what this soap is. It's no label, no nothing. So without asking too much about the soap review before we get there, it's, a, it's an unknown soap. Where did you acquire the soap from? I I found it this evening, um, in my in my uh, room. Uh, so it was sitting on my countertop, <laughs> just found my bureau. <laughs> yeah, well, it's been there for quite a while. I think it's been there from the holidays. Um, I, I don't want to describe. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I don't want to describe too much of it as we'll get into the review, but no, I, I found it. Uh, I found it. It's been sitting there and I, tonight I was like, you know what? I need something for the soap review. And I know I had some around the house. So we're going with uh, mystery soap review. We're not going to know anything about it. And uh, yeah, it's got, it's got some strong scent. Don't, so don't we'll give anything it's... away. Don't give anything away. Oh, I, want, oh, I want to hear the oh, full oh. review. Yep. Yep. hundred percent. So, spoilers. so I, I, you know, I have a, I have a couple things that, you know, Matt may not know about, um, <clears throat> about you, you know, uh, that uh, Terrence is a Massachusetts gentleman as well. Uh, he went to school in Massachusetts, has family in Massachusetts. So we really have three New Englanders yeah. on the show this evening. Technically four with Nicole. Um, yeah. But how? Uh, you know, I guess my my first question is for those that uh, that are familiar with you and know you, Terrence. Um, you know, I obviously you and I have a good personal friendship as well, and a good business part uh, friendship. Um, personal friendship, I would say, is even bigger than our business friendship, because I think Absolutely. probably on the business side, I probably drive you nuts. Um, because <laughs> we're, we're, right this time last year, I was coming to visit you every five minutes at the trade show booth just because we happened to be next door to each other, um, <laughs> and it was busy. And you're like, I'm in the middle of a meeting right now, and I'm like, I just beat Dominique at a free throw contest. <laughs> like, I have to speak to you. I don't bl- um, I didn't blame you for that. I, I would have done the yeah, same yeah, thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But you obviously you come from uh, you know you've been now with Agonors, I believe, the two years. It'll be, three, three? it'll be three in December. Yeah, and you you were with the Casada family because they're your your family um, as well. How do you transition? You're very recognizable in the industry. How do you transition uh, that recognition of you as a person and where you were connected before uh, to where you are now um, and and where you moved into uh, to with the Aganorsa and the Casa Fernandez, uh, which it was before. How do you transition to that? And were there benefits? Um, connected to that and were there uh you know cons to having that connection as well at the time i think that's a great question that's a great way to start so i would say on the on the plus side um i i've been in the business a while and i'm very fortunate to have some very good relationships with uh, a fair amount of retailers throughout the country i'd been at casada for 10 years and so i've been pretty much everywhere uh for the most part and and had built up some really great friendships and and, and, par- and partnerships with uh, our retail partners and many consumers as well. And uh, when I came to Aganorsa, Aganorsa, the accounts they tended to do well with, uh, and, th- and there were many accounts they did well with, um, weren't the accounts I had done well with a, a Casada necessarily in, in a lot of cases. So it was an opportunity for me to, to take in a lot of people that uh, I had built up a lot of goodwill and trust with and, and, and open the door to an opportunity for them to have Aganorsa. So on that side, uh, it was a huge benefit. Um, I would say, not on the downside, but what I have tried to do is make this more, more about the LEAF itself uh, uh, as a company rather than anything personally about me. Um, it could start a lot of the projects I had were very tied um, to my interests. Uh, things like we did a Casada Oktoberfest and we did, uh, um, you know, uh, some of the names used Latin. I had studied Latin and uh, college and uh and so there were a lot of personal connections to a lot of the projects and i and i didn't want that to be the case here uh one uh the only title in a business that ultimately matters is owner and so uh, i'm not the owner of the company and i don't think it's good business business for them uh to have 
too much of, uh, of a dependence on me. So my goal has been to really make um, the reason people purchase Aganorsa um, is due to the, the, the unique flavor of the tobacco and the way we, we uh, utilize the leaf that we grow. And, and that's been really more of the push for me. I, I haven't really, you know, been saying, oh, this is the cigar that I created to pair with beer or whatever else. Yeah, Terrence, we were talking a little bit before the show, and we were kind of getting into, you know, you guys are, it's a big, uh, it's a big operation you guys have over there. I mean, like I said, you have Agonorsa Leaf, you have JFR, you have Guardian of the Farm. So, you know, that's a lot of, a lot of cigars to make. That's a lot of tobacco to grow. How many cigars would you say you guys make per year? I think it's a, it's about 30,000 a day is the number. So whatever that, yep. I think Carney did the math before, whatever that adds up to, again, you, there's, you got to take out the holidays, which there's one about every week in Nicaragua. Yep. Um, and, and, uh, you know, the vacations and everything else, but it's, it's about 30,000 a day, but that's not just us. That's, a, that's, uh, our, our own proprietary brands, but there's also the brands that, uh, that we make for other people, uh, mm-hmm. you know, whether it's illusion or warped or foundation or Viaje, uh, HVC, um, some of the syndicato lines, uh, and, you know, and many other, uh, many other brands. Um, so that's everything. Yeah. Which, since you bring up, actually, we want to touch on this really quickly, but since you bring up HVC, one of my favorite cigars from HVC is the Black Friday. Uh, great cigar. Fantastic smoke. Yeah, great, great cigar. Um, and I, you know, I bought a box of those, and I think I still have, I think I have about half of it left still. It's, uh, I'm trying to, I'm trying to milk them. Um, but no, they're, this, they're so good. This past year or the year previous? This past year, the 2019, yeah. That, yeah. yeah. The, the short, like the short Robusto? Yeah. It's like a Rothschild exactly. size? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Great. Yeah, the 50 count box? Oh, yeah. Yeah. So good. It was so good. Uh, yeah, I know all, all the guys in my local shop, uh, they, they were smoking them like crazy. They all loved them. Uh, and then they gave me in the hair. Try, and I was like, oh, my God. And then we smoked it on the Ashles podcast that I'm also a part of. That was so great. I was all excited about that. It was a really good cigar. Um, but, yeah, so I I wanted to ask you. So, you know, since you are the, has such a big operation with everything going on, you know, how, how has the pandemic and all of that stuff impacted not only like your sales force and your sales business, but your manufacturing business as well, like down in Nicaragua? I mean, we've been very blessed. I mean, uh, we're, we're still up for the year. We had our best June ever last month. Um, we continue to grow. Uh, it probably slowed us a little down because we were way, way up, uh, January, February, and then we've been up every month this year, except April, but not to the degree other than June that we were up uh, January, February. Um, so it probably slowed us down a little bit with especially the Northeast was basically locked down. Uh, California was basically locked down. A lot of places were, you, were not open. So if you're not open, it's hard to, hard to do much business. Um, but, you know, like anything, people find a ways to get around that. We did a lot of Zoom meetings, uh, which nobody really in this industry had ever probably done in their life until this. And, and we've utilized that pretty successfully and, and, uh, a lot of phone calls and a lot of just staying in touch with our retail partners. Again, the, the, a lot of the goal for this time wasn't to try to sell anybody anything. It was to call them up and stay in touch. One of our sales reps, uh, in Texas, Ryan Fuller, he did like weekly conferences where all, uh, all his retailers were invited to come on and, uh, be on zoom and talk about what they're experiencing, how to get the uh, PP uh, loans and, uh, and, you know, just all that kind of stuff. And I think people appreciate that. And, and, uh, you know, when they, when they're ready to buy, they remember the people that were there to, to, you know, weren't calling them and saying, Hey, you know, you know, we, we, we buy 50 boxes and, uh, and try to milk money out of them when they're obviously expensing a tough time. So uh, overall it's been successful on, on the sales side and Nicaragua, again, we've been blessed. It's, you know, like it, Everywhere in Latin America, for the most part, quite frankly, you're only as good as your last day. Um, right. But but for, throughout this, uh, we haven't had a lot of problems. I mean, we, we've you had some people that are out of fear, don't want to come come to work, and we respect that. Or um, you, know, you know, social distancing, pushing the tables apart, obviously that creates issues and can slow you down a little bit. But overall, shipments have been coming in. Uh, it's been pretty much. Uh, normal business as far as uh as far as production is concerned you know knock on wood it's funny it's funny because you you you, the culture the people that haven't been down to cigar factories the culture of how these cigars are made the rollers and they work in pairs um so one does the binder and filler and the other one's doing the wrapper tobacco so there's this culture of this is how it's done and this is how it's going to happen so you change that culture because of a pandemic and nobody really gets it. I, I yeah. know I was talking to, to Lito, and it was like, 
hey, he goes, the hardest thing for me to do is to tell this roller, this pair of rollers that sit right next to each other. They have to be apart. And the only thing I'm thinking is when the table's pulled apart, I was like, what is the guy doing the binder and filler, like tossing it across the room, you know, or six <laughs> feet over to the guy's right. like, hey, Pablo, here you go. Um, you know, like so that's what's in my head. Yeah, yeah, yeah like pizza shop, pizza. like a, yeah. exactly, or like fish market out in Seattle. Like, they're like, here you go. You'll throw, you know, the JFRs and somebody like breaks an arm. On a, on a 7 by 90 JFR or something. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's big problems. <laughs> Those are easier to catch, though. There, you know, with the bigger ring gauge, it's an easier, you know. The Lanceros are tough, you know. Yeah, the, um, uh, oh, I totally lost what I was just about to say. Oh, yeah. Uh, I, so I had, um, kind of going on the same thing. I noticed in the last few weeks, some of the other manufacturers, um, have announced, you know, obviously last week, all, all of us were supposed to be at the PCA trade show, which obviously didn't happen. Um, and I, that's a big time of the year, you know, for, you know, manufacturers release new product, take orders and sell product retailers to see what else is new, what's coming out, place orders, buy some new product. Obviously that didn't take place this year. So I guess maybe I have like a two part question, but the first thing I would say is, you know, I noticed in the last two weeks, a lot of companies were coming out with their own special ways to kind of work around not having that trade show for example i know cle you know christian and tom they've been traveling around uh steve Saka, dunbarton he's going to have his own like vert, um the dunbarton timeshare experience i believe it's called uh so these companies are finding ways to still reach out to their clients and their customers and find ways to to educate show them what's new give them information uh i believe when i was reading Saka's press release he was gonna also make it so that retailer staff could also work with them and be on this and, and get information and stuff so how are you guys kind of working around that uh not having the trade show to to showcase and, and work with your retailers so one is we, we ran what we would have normally done at the show in June. So that, that obviously had, a, had an impact. Um, and we, we, uh, we did some, just some videos uh, that showcased the new products, what they looked like, what they're about, um, that we, we sent to our retail partners. Uh, we don't use all in-house reps, uh, but the in-house reps did, did a, a virtual trade show in June where they sent out the videos of the, of the product line, uh, set up appointments on Zoom, and then uh, over the course of a week, uh, just, you know, did half hour video conferences with their retailers uh, all day, from, uh, Monday through Friday. And uh, that was really successful. I think that the, the trick with the trade show is everyone's like, oh, well, we don't need a trade show now. One is that we need to see what business looks like in a couple of months before we can say that. And the other thing is, of course, right now, it's like some lounge owners I've heard say, I don't need a lounge. Like, we, you know, I had uh, nobody in the lounge for two months and my business was barely affected. And, and the problem with that is that nobody else's lounge was open. So when, once other lounges are open, if you get rid of your lounge, you shrink your lounge, well, now a person has a choice and he may go someplace else. So right, if, if, right now we don't have anything to compare it to. If, if there were a trade show uh, and half the industry didn't go and half of it did, you could kind of make a comparison of like, okay, well, you know, what's the benefits of, of a trade show? Um, but when there's no other option, um, I don't know. I think it's still hard to say whether – whether you know, or I, I think it's hard to you know put the, the, the nail in the coffin of the trade show just yet. Also, it's important to remember that this is a person-to-person -person business. Yes, and we're using new tools, we're using Zoom, and we're using all sorts of things. But at the end of the day, uh, I think there's something special about being together with other industry people, and and that's what we enjoy and having a drink and a laugh and a cigar. And uh, and I don't I think if we lost that altogether, that would be a loss for the industry. And it would be a loss for me, quite frankly, because that's what I enjoy about this industry is, is, is doing those events and being with our, our uh, consumers or retail partners and getting a chance to really spend time face to face. Uh, so I, I don't know if that's going to go away and I don't want it to or think it should. Um, but certainly it hasn't hurt us uh, having to make adjustments um, thus far. Yeah. Um, you know, it's 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 unprecedented time. I and mean, we we've talked about it every week ever since this thing started. You know, this show has been a product of the whole pandemic and just basically being able to get together and, and like you know, like you said, be a very personal business, but it's also a face to face business. But you know, when you can't have that, you, you, you make the best and you have the videos and so that's kinda how we started this and you know, and, and, the, and every week we've been on here, we've we brought up the pandemic and how it's affected people or, you know, me and John will give updates on you know, how it's affected us and how we're still rolling through. And, you know, up here in New England, things are a little bit more open again and people are, I don't want to say normal, 
because uh, I mean, really, what is normal now? But it's a little bit less restricted, so things are you know different up here, and people can still kind of go back in, in and out of their shops and lounges now and and hang out. Um, but yeah, I mean, you have to adapt to the times, and you know, just make the best of what you have. Um, you know, John, I guess you know, I don't know if I don't even know if I've asked you this question. But I, same question, really, for La Flor de Manicana. I don't, I don't know if I brought that up with you before on the show, but you know, how, how are you guys really working to kind of get through that whole experience as well? I have no idea. Just <laughs> it. That's a great answer. <laughs> I really don't know what I'm doing. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I mean, I mean, we're just, we're just doing it. You know, what I mean, yeah. we're doing what we got to do. No, uh, you, it's, it's constant follow up. Um, you know, the majority of people I'm working with on my team are all in-house salespeople. Um, so I would say it's a little, uh, it's a little easier in regards to accomplishing tasks you want to get done, but it's also a little more challenging on the personal level because you're not just running a company. You've got people who are personally being affected by this, whether it's losing a job or not being able to go out and travel. Cause I have a team that's used to being out on the road all the time. Like I am, this is the longest I've been in one place for over 10 years. Right. Um, and the same thing for my salespeople. Um, so, you, you know, you've got to work with them, um, you know, and make sure they're in a mentally in a, in a strong space at the same time where you're making sure your business is in a strong position to succeed uh, as best possible uh, with the circumstances that you're in. So you, the, and the thing is, the circumstances change daily. And I think you probably, you know, we had a conversation earlier about something else before the show started. And I was like, I can't get a straight answer out of anybody about what's going on. I go, it's like, it's crazy everywhere. Every, everything I hear is like, oh, this place is perfect. And then this place is a mess. Um, you know, it's the same thing. It's because things change every single day. Um, so when things are changing every day, emotions are changing every day. Um, so you're managing those emotions of your retail partners. You're managing the emotions in the business side of your teams. You're managing, managing the, man, uh, the, you know, the emotional and business side of the people that you work for and the business you're involved in. I mean, it's a moving target, you know, you're, you're, you know, reality, you know, at the end of this, we'll get to look at this as a great case study is how you manage a business through a pandemic and with all these circumstances and all these different things. Uh, but it really is, it's a day to day thing. Uh, you know, what I have planned, what I have planned for two weeks might not happen. Uh, you know, what I have planned tomorrow might not happen. Uh, so I go day to day, week to week, month by month. Uh, but it really is a day by day and it's a moving target. Yeah. Um, you know, that's pretty, you know, it's pretty much what we've heard from most people. It's, you know, um, taking it in small bites, I would say is, is a good thing. Um, it's a good way to describe it rather. Um, you know, and you know, we'll see. And, you know, I, I would, I think, uh, looking at the calendar, we had talked about this before the next major cigar event or industry event gathering would be the TPE in January because the inner tobacco has been canceled. Um, the PCA was canceled, Unless I'm missing one, I think it would be TPE in January, and so far that's still on. So, you know, I, I know that obviously that could change at any time. That could also be canceled, and and lately, you know, the word around the industry, from what I've been hearing from some of my other friends and, and colleagues and contacts and people I know, is, you know, even the PCA show for next year is kind of up in the air and in question whether that may or may not even happen. So, um, again, you know, we could be looking. And who knows? This the the whole virus thing. This could blow up again and it could get really bad it could get worse than it was this year and we could be right back to where we were you know back in march and april or worse um you know terrence you're down in florida you know recently now they're saying you know florida is really beginning to spike now and so you know now now florida and and i believe uh, texas and arizona i think is some other states i've heard where it's it's you know the, now they're getting major outbreaks again so you know like lounges and shops are being closed down there i think terrence you were saying before like down in florida your stuff is all closed again so it's going to be that probably that off and on, you know, we really don't know certain areas, you know, will, will open and close again. So everything's kind of up in the air. Um, so, yeah, I mean, it's, it's tough, you know, it's, I mean, my, myself, you know, I'm not in the cigar business, you know, by day, by day, I have, you know, I have another career that I, that I have. And even I, I was home for 10 weeks. I didn't go to work. I was just dropped at home and didn't really do much. And it was horrible. It was fun for the first two weeks. It was great. It felt like vacation. Kind <laughs> got of. Old. Got old. Uh, I'm, I'm laughing because I wanted you to go that, you know, I'm not in the cigar business by day, but by night I'm the cigar Batman. <laughs> <laughs> I, damn, what a missed opportunity that was. <laughs> by night I'm the cigar Batman. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Even the voice, the grovelly voice and everything. Man. 
Uh, I know what a missed opportunity, but yeah. So if, so. Anybody, <laughs> if anybody noticed, I keep scratching my face and my eyes and stuff. I've got these two tiki torches that are in front of me because I'm out in the back deck, and I keep getting like a layer of tiki torch stuff on my face and in my eyes. That's good for you. So, so I'm struggling. I think it's the citronella. I believe is, is something, but it's, it's right the, in my face. Well, also, you know, we have we have a comment on on the in the Facebook chat. We have um. Let me, uh, I just had it in. It's gone. Uh, where is it? Oh, yeah, from uh, Franklin Pauly. Um, I'm getting used to Carney with hair. <laughs> and I think that's that's it's been said a few times uh, on the show during this quarantine. Is Carney, Carney's known for really having no hair up on the top, the face or the or the top of the head. So to say, and it, it was longer at one point, <laughs> it was out much- of control. Yeah, it was it was much mangier, um, but you know, and then of course, right around the time of really summer really took off, John took this beautiful shot in the pool, um, with the sunglasses on, with the wet hair, curled back, and it was such a like a men's GQ shot, and it looked beautiful. Um, and uh, I haven't seen much of that lately, but I think people are like saying like, all right, I'm ready for the old John Carney to come back. Like the one from your, you know, your, your, your Instagram profile picture shows you just all clean, just no hair. And I think this is starting to scare people because they're, they're used to that. So I don't know when you, are you going to, are you going to, are you going to go clean shaved again and shave the head and everything? Nah, no, nah, we're going to keep the, we're going to keep the hair till it goes away and then I'll go, uh, then I'll shave it once it's gone. But uh, I, I cleaned so up the beard a little bit, and, and mangy is a good term for it. It was definitely mangy. I was like a stray dog, and it was bad. It was out of control. I hadn't cut it. I hadn't cut it for four months. Um, so about three weeks ago, I went and got a haircut. So I, I am going to do my high and tight again, probably on the sides. But I, I'm pl- I put a lot of work into this beard. I mean, it takes me a while to grow in these spots. So this is a lot of effort. So I think this is this is the way. Uh, you know, this is the way. You do that you. It will be. And I'm going to do yeah. me, and and uh, and then when it goes away, I'll shave it again because I know it works out. And Terrence, you, your family being hair experts, uh, especially your son, which is a <laughs> highlight of your social media, um, it was it was not out of control like your son does because even out of control for your son is is incredible hair. I mean, mine was mine was a mess. I mean, it was embarrassingly <laughs> disgusting. Um, so I don't. I'm not blessed with the Riley. Uh, the Riley jeans uh, of that, just that beautiful hairline. And, uh, you know, he's got a lot, he's got a, a, a good uh, lineage uh, in front of him and a lot of great hair days in front of him. I, I had very few in my, I think my best hair days may be behind me. <laughs> at least I can, at least I contributed in some way, you know, I gotta do, I gotta do something on my part. No, it's, uh, he's got some good hair. And then it's funny because over the years, I've always posted pictures of his crazy hair. And then uh, my hair, uh, I couldn't get a haircut for like two months and I looked like Tom Hanks in Castaway. And so then it was like, yeah, that's where that crazy hair comes from. So uh, if I let it get out of control, it doesn't look too much different than his. Yeah, my girlfriend was when, when I we were in the middle of the quarantine and we were, you know, it was before I actually had taken upon myself to just cut my hair really short because I just couldn't take it. I couldn't go get my hair cut. And I'd be video chatting every night with my girlfriend. And it got to a point where it was so long and she just started calling me Cosmo Kramer. <laughs> and it was at that point that I said, I can't let this happen. And I just, I, next day I went to my bathroom and I got my clippers and I just, I got the biggest clip I had and I just, I cut it so it wasn't ridiculously short, but I chopped a lot off and I felt better about myself. Uh, I didn't worry about it being even and all that because I, I knew no one was going to see me, but still. And, and I remember Ter- Terrence, you posted a photo on Facebook. I don't remember when it was a little while ago, but you kind of posted like a before and after. Yeah, like yeah, yeah. When yeah. you went in, and then after, and you had it's such such a much longer hair. <laughs> hair is a big part of identity, man. That's why at boot camp they shave it all off, and uh, you know that's a uh, it's part of who you are. I, I, what you do with it. Absolutely. Um, actually, I let me just touch back on the Supreme Leaf really quick. This is excellent. I'm really getting into, um, almost, almost, almost at the beginning of the second third. And it's wow. This is great. Amazing, amazing flavor. It's smooth, real smooth. Yeah. Just it's um, smooth. It's like a milkshake. It's like rich, but yeah. it's not, it's not aggressive at all. Yeah. It is not a lot of like heavy spice notes or pepper notes no. in it. It's nope. really smooth. Um, I don't, it's not the same as the, like the, the Connecticut, the agonors of the Connecticut you have over there, which is a cigar I like. I also find very creamy, very smooth. But in 
the, obviously the flavors are different, but in that same aspect, it's, it it burns well. A lot of smoke. It's smooth. This is it's it's. I mean, yeah, I would say it's rich. Um, it it's definitely an easy smoke. It's not a smoke that I would say is going to overpower you. It's, um, you know. You don't necessarily, you know, it's it's not like you know some of that stuff that uh, what what are they called, La Flor Dominicana? Is that that? <laughs> um, some of that stuff that's just way too strong. You gotta really have a full belly for. Uh, no, I joke, but uh, no, it's it's good. This is a sm- I could smoke this during the day. I could smoke it at night. I could, I could honestly, I would smoke this in the morning too. This is really an all all day, anytime smoke for me. Um, I, I'm definitely gonna be buying. I gotta, I gotta, I have to get a box. You no, know, know what I like from a floor, which I think is probably the worst seller for you guys, is because I remember one time I was like, "What is Lido smoke?" I can't remember if it was you or Tony. You told me the, the Petit Corona Cameroons. Yeah, two thousand number three. Yeah, and so I was like, "All right, that's what that's what I want to smoke." I, I love that cigar, but I never see them anywhere. I, it's like I, I, I don't, I don't well, even know if you guys sell them other than to well, him. no. Well, <laughs> well, we do. It's funny. I had an account ask me this one time because a few years ago we were out of them for a few months, and they they were our number one seller of them. Uh, in the country and they were like hey i have a question for you and i said okay what and they're like it's gonna maybe be i'm just confused but i was like she's like she goes you've been out of these camera number threes for the last eight months practically so i've got in like 10 boxes she's like that's Lido's cigars she's like so like what is Lido's smoke when we're out of the cameroon cab when you're out of the cameroon cabinet or it used to be 2000 number threes she's like what does he smoke I'm like, oh, oh, Lito always smokes the 2000 number threes. <laughs> yeah, they're yeah, always in stock. Yeah. <laughs> so we always joke around. We're like, it'd be a bigger seller if, if it wasn't all smoked by us. You know, smoking the specifically him. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I mean, it's his everyday cigar. And he's a Cameroon smoker, which is kind of a unique thing. Because I was thinking about that one day. Because he said something along the lines of, and I don't know if you have this too. But if you're a cigar maker, you're smoking all day, right? Yeah. So for him, that Cameroon is kind of like a palate cleanser. It's like after every cigar he smokes or when he transitions to the next thing, he has, you know, essentially a palate cleanser. So I was thinking there, I'm like, you know, Cameroon tends to have sweetness, natural sweetness, nuttiness to it, which would really, really actually be a nice palate cleanser for smoking full body cigars. It's a great cigar, man. I I love it. That, the bowl, obviously everybody loves the bowl. And uh, what was it? The 20, was it the 25th with the white label? The 25th? What's the one that just Uh, came out? That's the gold label, the 25th. Um, yeah. You have a white label one that I actually really like, um, which was from last year's trade show, I believe. Uh, oh, the, you guys, the, the signature, the, correct? Signature, yeah, signature, yeah. Hey, uh, yeah, that's one of the ones I really personally enjoy, too. Um, I smoked that, I believe, when uh, this was in, like, February or March, right before the lockdown. We, we met at Galliano and Coral Gables right around our neck of the woods. And uh, I'd had that signature at the event you had, and that was a really nice cigar. It was I, it was right before the Super Bowl because we we were smoking yeah, some right. football. Yeah, so, that's right. Yeah, it was right before the Super Bowl. So, Terrence, other than the supreme the supreme leaf um, from Agonorsa, um, you guys have anything new that you were going to have coming out this year that maybe you could talk about, or anything like that, maybe from any year or even Agonorsa, but. Um, you know, from you know JFR or the Guardian of the Farm line. There's there's two other things. One just came out recently, and the other one will be shipping uh, towards the end of the month. Uh, we had the Lunatic Torch, which was a brand that existed, but uh, it was it's it was not put together well in the sense of the, it was one size, and the packaging looked ridiculous, and it it, uh, it was like a Churchill size and instead of being a brush foot, uh, which is what the torch is now. It was a shaggy foot, which is the tobacco was jutting out towards the end. It was it was not a clean fin, uh, finish of the cigar. Um, Don't to interrupt. Point. Can you pause right there? Because that's a really interesting thing. What what what's the difference between a brush foot and a shaggy foot? If you don't mind sharing that. My, my understanding, and I'm not a manufacturer, but a brush foot is when you take the wrapper basically off the the, the last half inch or inch of the cigar, um, but it's still cut fully and it's it's clean. It just the wrapper is not there for the last half inch or inch. Uh, a shaggy foot is where the tobacco is just kind of jutting out and it hasn't been cut. So you'll have like different pieces. It's come, it's, it looks more like an actual torch in that sense where there's different pieces all shooting up uh, out of out of the out of the cigar. But not um, quite a close foot. Yeah. No, it's not a clo- close foot. It's not close. Yeah, but at it all. hangs it, over. It not and it doesn't hang over. It shoots that like the fillers are jutting out of the of the cigar. Oh, uh, okay. It, it's not. It's not. You know, like usually when they're done, they cut the cigar. So anything that's that's uh, coming out is is clipped off, and it, you have a clean right. a clean foot. Instead of doing that, 
they don't do that. Uh, and so then you just have the, the tobaccos, you know, wildly sticking out. Um, that's a, that's a shaggy foot. And then in the case of the shaggy foot, you, it was, it was a too long a smoke. The, the way we, ha- we conceive it is we do what's called an agonorsa experience is where you get to taste two of the key components of our tobacco, uh, and you smoke them ind- independently and then put them together, uh, kind of Cheech and Chong style. And you get to see how that creates uh, a flavor profile that neither one separately have. And that's kind of the backbone of our flavor. And so with the, the idea with the torch is that you're able to kind of taste that filler binder tobaccos before they hit our Corojo 99 wrapper and see how uh, it's not balanced in the beginning, but it, it, it's, uh, it's, it's kind of zesty, it wakes up the palate, and then it hits the wrapper and it becomes more complex and balanced. Um, and so it's an opportunity for people that can't attend an event, which is uh, common now, uh, to be able to kind of experience that, that transition. Um, but we, again, the idea is eventually to get to the wrapper. So for on the, on the current edition, it's only about a half inch. So you're smoking the, uh, the, 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 the cigar without the wrapper on it for about five minutes, maybe, uh, before you actually transition to the wrapper on the, on the old edition, you were smoking for like a half hour and you were kind of like, all right, I get it. But, uh, you know, I'd like to actually enjoy the cigar at this point. Um, and so that's kind of been the idea behind it. And we change the sizes. We have, uh, sizes that sell and the packaging, it, it's clearly something we make and it's part of our line. Um, and that's been really successful for us, um, as one project. The other is our anniversarial line. The anniversarial line, um, we usually release an exclusive size for uh, formerly IPCPR and now PCA attendees um, at the show. But this year, motorcycle. Sorry about that. Uh, th- this year, at uh, it said because there's no show, what we're doing is is uh, our top accounts or what we call our Agonors Select accounts had, had the opportunity to purchase uh, up to six boxes of it. Um, and it's a cigar made in Miami. Uh, it's all rolled by a single roller, um, uh, you know, both bunching and and, uh, and 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 put the wrapper on uh, by hand. They don't use Lieberman's like uh, in Nicaragua, like most factories. I believe you guys do this too. It's uh, teams of two. One bunches using a Lieberman, and the other one puts the wrapper on. Uh, in Miami, uh, it's one roller uh, makes the entire cigar by hand, um, and it and the, the cigar also uses our. Uh, our Corojo uh, 99 shade grown Maduro. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's a wrapper we grow in Jalapa under cheesecloth under, under you know, tapado, they call it. And, and usually you'd associate that with a lighter wrapper, but we actually take higher primings and ferment it for a longer period of time. Um, and, and that creates a dark, rich Maduro hue. So it's a Maduro uh, Corojo that we grow proprietary to us and it features that wrapper. So it's a, it's a only 250 boxes are made each year. Uh, it's a very small run, 10 count boxes this year. Uh, it's in the Maduro for the first time, and it's uh, a six and a quarter by 54. Uh, uh, what's called a, a 109 head. It's got the, it's a, it's in between a Toro and a Torpedo. Well, that's definitely some interesting stuff. I, I had seen the torch. I actually, I'll be honest, I haven't had the torch yet. Um, but I, I've, I've been, it's been on my list of, of cigars to get, and. Um, you know, I, I've like you know, I've seen it, and you know, I, I've smoked a lot of the Agonorsa, the Lunatic, Guardian of the Farm. So I am excited to try that. Um, and even from the end of the, uh, I'm sorry, when did you say that the Anniversario was coming out? The, the it, it'll start shipping at the very end of this month, early August. Okay. Okay. Yeah. So I mean, I, that's another one. I, you know, I'd love to try. You know, like I said, I'm a, I'm a fan of the brand. Um, it's it's in my repertoire of, of regular smoke, so excited to try that as well. Um, and, and, when I, and when I say that it's one roller in this particular instance, one roller made all the cigars. So every wow. single cigar is made by her name is uh, Elizabeth Rodil, and uh, she makes every single one. Wow, that's impressive. You know, to have one person make all that. I mean, in a grand scheme, I guess when you think, you know, these people who work in the factories every day, and you know, they're making cigar, you know, cigar after cigar after cigar. But you know, when you when it's one specific cigar and it's one collection and one person made that whole thing. That's, that's cool. Um, you know, especially, you know, even for the, in the consumer base, you know, people who, who really get into the cigar geeks as some people call them. Um, like even myself, uh, that's, I find that interesting. Uh, and, and I, you, you, you appreciate that a little bit more too, um, which is cool. But I had another question about the Supreme leaf. So I, I know that, it, you know, you originally released this back in January. I want, you said, uh, in, in the Robusto size and now you have the Toro size. So, is there any other sizes planned for this, or right now you're just running the Robusto and Toro? We're, we're looking at that now. Uh, one is one is the whether we come out with maybe you know the, 
in January the the Robusto Toro and maybe one other size and try to make it a regular line that depends on the tobacco. Uh, the other option will be to do and just keep doing individual sizes twice a year, um, and that that's the other option. So we're just seeing how much tobacco we have and and how feasible doing one or the other is and what makes more sense. So I, I think we're probably going to end up doing just one size twice a year, unique size twice a year. But it would be nice. Like, well, again, and, and John can obviously speak to this. Uh, it's always it's always a good thing when people want to, to try the cigar, but it also can be a frustration if they can't get their hands on it. So I'll have people send me messages like, oh, where, you know, can I get a Supreme Leaf? And I'll be like, well, uh, go here. And then they, they go there and it's like, oh, well, they're out of it. And I go, ah, oh, this place and they're out of it. So that can be frustrating too. So you want to balance it where you're, you're producing quality product and you don't ever want to take away from that. But you also want to make sure that people have the opportunity to smoke it and uh, it's not, you know, it's not uh, frustrating to the consumer to have to go on a, a treasure hunt necessarily to, to find some. Yeah. Uh, you know, and, and that's it with, with, there's a lot of cigars out there. There's a lot of different brands and, and stuff like that, you know, hard to find. And, you know, I mean, you look at LFD with the, with the Andalusian bowl. I mean, you know, a cigar that's not readily available, you know, you have, of course you have, you know, the Opus X stuff, which is on its own. It's just, it's, it's a monster. And, people fight over that and, and pay ridiculous amounts for it so yeah i mean the whole you know getting the, the stuff that's harder to get you know usually it, it, it creates much more of a frenzy um one, one thing i wanted to ask you so we've talked a, lot, a little bit about agonor Salif. we've talked about jfr tell us a little bit more about guardian of the farm i feel like we haven't really touched on that so far on the show so guardian of the farm was a uh, collaboration between uh uh eduardo fernandez the owner of the company his son max fernandez and uh, Kyle Gellis from Warp Cigars. They're both dog people. Uh, Kyle has a dog, uh, American Bulldog, I believe. And uh, we use American Bulldogs to guard our, our uh, some of our facilities in Nicaragua farms and fields. And, uh, and so it was created as kind of a tribute to the dogs. Each size is named after one. Um, ah. and, and so that was kind of how it came about. So the size that's named after Kyle's uh, dog has a Warp band on it as well. And the three that are named after us just have the, the single primary band. And it was a real, it was a successful project. Uh, one, uh, Kyle is, is very popular uh, with his Warp brand with a lot of people. And uh, and so it, it benefited us in that way. And also, you know, because we're making it, distributing it, um, the price point on it is good. It's it's uh, it's like 7 to $8. So it's very reasonable price point. We're, we're vertically integrated. Um, and hopefully, we you know, that introduced some people to, to him as well. Um, and so it was, a, it was a, a really successful collaboration. It was a top 10 cigar of the year in Cigar Aficionado. And it's funny because people, I'll, I'll be at an event and somebody will be like, oh, I'll try this one. I'm like, oh, don't you want to know what it tastes like? They're like, no, I love dogs. I'm like, yeah, but, you know, I don't know if that means you'll like it. And they're like, no, I love dogs. I'm going to try it. And they always like it. So it's, it's funny how people identify with things because the logo on the band is, uh, is an American bulldog. Um, and again, it's, it's another one of these things that's, uh, you always want to balance having an interesting idea with. With something that's genuine, we do use the you know American Bulldogs down there. It's it, you know it's something we just came up with. To be fair, uh, at the our main factory in Esteli, it's not really a guard dog. It's more, I mean that dog is used to people coming around and you know, yeah. seeing people, so that's kind of just a friendly dog. But the ones up in Jalapa are uh, are all business, and so you don't want to mess around with, with those dogs. Um, so it's it, it's a really cool project, and it's been really successful for us. Yeah, it's really interesting. I, I like hearing stuff like that. I, one of the things. Um, you know, you, you know, you guys talk about the dogs and, uh, I haven't been myself, but a, a close personal friend of mine who's in the business, uh, has gone to the, the Perdomo tour, the fact in down in Nicaragua. And he mentioned that, you know, in, in Nicaragua, you know, Nick had, Nick doesn't use any, um, doesn't use any machines out in the farms. They just use the oxen. Yeah, we uh, do that too. You do that too. So is that really like a Nicaraguan thing? A lot of you guys do that down there where they just, you use them to just kind of well, walk the field. Guys, I mean, Nicaragua is pretty cool, but in the Dominican Republic, I actually strap the plows over my shoulders yeah. and do the fields myself. Yes, that's 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 one of the so, unique uh, aspects of, uh, of Dominican tobacco is that the fields are plowed by you. Yeah, and when they talk about migrant farm workers, I try to keep this private, but I mean, I, I go down there for a certain period of extended period of time, an undisclosed period of time, and actually plow the fields myself uh, similar to like what an oxen would do. I didn't know if you wanted to, people to know that. That's why I didn't bring it up. But uh, it's uncomfortable sometimes. But I, you know, I like to pat my own back. <laughs> uh, no, I mean I would say again. Also, Nicaragua. It's uh, 
again, it's a, it's a much more rural country and things like that. And machinery, if you have machinery, machinery breaks down, you need parts for machines. You know, it, it's uh, you need techs that know how to you know fix the machines. And so uh, if we kind of do everything traditional. A lot of people uh, prefer it that way in, in Nicaragua. And if it's not broke, don't fix it. The oxen are doing a good job. Uh, let's not uh, mess around with that. Yeah, I like that, the whole concept of that. Like, you know, you're saying like the kind of old school way. And, you know, when you <clears throat> it's one of those things you look at the entire process of how cigars are manufactured, you know, from, you know, as they say, from, you know, from from seed to from seed to sale. You know, when when the cigar is bought in a, in a retail store, um, it's amazing, and especially you know when you look at a lot of these companies, you know, such as yourself, and you know even La Flor Dominicana, and you know all of the big things out there. You know, you watch the, the methods to not only just how, how they grow their tobacco, how they age the tobacco, and it's fermented, how it's rolled, put together, it's boxed, and everything. It's really, it, it's it's for me at least, it's very interesting, you know, to hear about, and the fact that you guys still, you know, operate the fields and the farms that way is 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 amazing it's in the modern era you know and um you know especially you know when you have like you were saying you know in a rural country where you know machines are, is almost like a luxury in a sense because it, it's hard you know if they break down and having people to fix that um we have a question from jared gullick do you use the oxen to keep the soil from being too compressed you're basically you know to, to tear up the soil again i'm not a farmer so i don't want to go right. too into detail but basically you know turn up the soil for 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 planting is the, is the purpose of it. So right. it, like for growing almost anything, you have to do that. Right. Yeah. And one of the things I've been told about that is, you know, uh, one of the questions I remember I was in, a, I was in a group of people when, when I was told that story originally, when I f heard about it and the question was, says, well, don't, you know, don't they, you know, go wild and, you know, they roam and, and crush the plants. And I was told, you know, no, they, they just, they know when they're, you know, to walk the rows, they, you know, they mind their business they don't step on the plants. They they know you know where to walk through the fields. Uh, but yeah, castration also, takes a lot of your uh, uppityness out of you. <laughs> yeah, but <laughs> your you know, orderliness. Also, if if they if they are provoked, um, you know they will they will maybe attack. So th th there's also that you, you don't want to uh, attack one of the oxen. But John, you know, I was wondering, you know, maybe before we hit the overtime period, maybe we should do the the famous John Carney soap review. I know we have an interesting soap tonight, as we mentioned before. The highlight of my day. Let's do it. Yeah, Terrence. So welcome, the welcome. Lights here. Welcome to the the other part of the Smoke and Tobacco Show, where John washes his hands with a new type of soap. Now you obviously know. Um, welcome about, to Tribal Council, boys. Terrence, <laughs> Terrence, so Terrence, so Terrence obviously, obviously knows, knows about, about the soap review videos, videos, that, went videos that went on when you came from Miami, from Miami to Maine. Um, so that's kind so of. That's kinda, I'm assuming he knows. I'm not sure if he does. I, I I've I've heard them. I haven't actually okay. witnessed one yet. Ah, ah okay. Okay. So this will be, so this uh, will be uh, Terrence's, Terrence's first, time first time as well. Time as well. Gonna, All right, gonna... so the soap reviews, just a, just a little bit of a uh, background on it. Um, I started doing soap reviews as COVID-19 came up. It was a little bit of a joke, but it was it came about because of all the time that I spent in airports and watching people not wash their hands. So I was like, this is disgusting. I'm going to start using some soaps. And then, by the way, I'm like, I'm going to start reviewing these things and start giving them um, a scale. Uh, and... Matt had sent me actually a holiday soap, which we used last week uh, and finally reviewed. He'd sent that to me at the beginning of the coronavirus. And uh, so we reviewed it. And I was the intention was to keep reviewing soaps throughout March, April, May. Uh, but travel stopped and I was at home and uh, we were all trying to figure out what was the next step. So the soap reviews died, but they were in revived uh, back here on uh, Smoking Tobacco Live. So. This is what we have today. We have a very special soap. It's so special, I have no idea what it is. Uh, so this soap is a soap that was uh, in my house. Uh, it's been in my room for at least a year, I would say now. Uh, but it's been on my bureau. No idea how it got there, uh, but it's in uh, non-distinct packaging. It's got clear cellophane. Now, this is something that we're going to do. This feels very similar to the type of cellophane that may be on cigars, which isn't actually plastic cigar tip it's actually paper um so this kind of feels like it but a way you can tell if cellophane's paper or plastic is by the way it burns plastic kind of melts and this is plastic and paper burns so if you light up your cellophane on a cigar traditionally that should burn with a little bit of smoke to it like a clean smoke plastic will kind of melt so if you can see this here 
we'll show you. See how it's melting, not burning? This is true plastic. It had that feel, but huh. there wasn't much smell through it. Uh, but there you I'll go. Be honest, so I'll be honest, I've never heard of that before. before. Yeah, neither yeah. have I. Well, I learned something new yeah, majority already. Of yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, majority of the cellophane in the cigar industry is, a, is actually a paper product. Um, it looks like plastic, feels like plastic, uh, plastic product, but it's actually made of paper. Um, so you've got the soap open. I couldn't smell much through the cellophane, which is coincidentally similar to cigars, uh, but there was a little bit on the end, so this is very fragrant. <sighs> I'm going to be honest. We didn't do the holiday soap last week. We did the jasmine soap, didn't we? Yeah, that was, yeah, a, few that was a few weeks ago. I've, holiday soap. I've got the jasmine soap here next to me, so let me bring this on. Is uh, This is a jasmine soap. So we've got, it's not the same brand because that was a homemade brand. Uh, this is obviously a little bit more commercialized, uh, perfectly cut, uh, not as rustic as last week's soap. But this is a jasmine. Uh, it's got a, a more waxy feel than the uh, handmade soap. The handmade soap, remember when I, I put my finger through it, uh, you know, with my fingernail here, I was kind of um, grainy, um, but it didn't have a lot of oil to it. This is very waxy. Um, it's almost like a wax. You see it here in my fingernails. Wow. Um, so, yeah, very, very waxy. Do you very prefer that? Strong. Is that, is that I, a plus? I, 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 neither, I neither prefer prefer nor don't prefer. Uh, I think that's a double negative right there. <laughs> but uh, I, I, neither, I neither prefer or not prefer um, that way. I don't know what my preferences are. Uh, but uh, the jasmine soap last week was very nice. The reason last week's soap was so good is that it didn't leave a film and it didn't leave a lot of scent on your hand. Because one thing I dislike is washing my hands and then picking up food and putting it in my mouth and having that taste or that scent. I don't want to impact what I'm doing, like my cigar. I don't want that to smell like jasmine. Um, but this is, on the scent level, it's, it's got a strong scent. Now that it's aired out a little bit, it's not too strong. But I have my trusty bucket here full of water. What I like to do first is wet the hands. So, John, so John there's, there's, a question, there's a question, there's a question that, was that was asked. And it's, uh, do you, uh, do you think, think that it is a cocoa, cocoa butter, butter or a shea, shea butter, butter soap? soap? I don't think this is butter at all. Ooh, I, I don't think this is butter. I think this is a, a wax-based soap. Mm. Um, oh, and we have yeah, I would say this is a wax-based soap. So it, it doesn't feel buttery at all. Um, it, it's more of a it's more of a wa waxy oil oil and, base. So we like to wet the hands, and then I like to wet the soap a little bit. Uh, one thing we do judge, Terrence, is we do look at uh, how it's uh, how it foams up. If it Ooh. suds up on your hands, the coverage of the hands, the hand feel. I would so imagine getting, a lot of a lot of suds and, and soapiness would probably be a good thing. It is, but la it was interesting. Last week's soap didn't have a lot of soapiness and a lot of suds. Um, and it was a very clean, rich, um, rich soap. You know, it had a lot of essential oils in it. Um, oh wow! So yeah, that's not so a, that's not a that's not a it's uh, not a deal breaker. Yeah, it's not Testy. a deal breaker. Okay. No. No, and my hands were a little bit dirty tonight, but all right. So we're getting a little more lather than last week's soap and a little more coverage. The feel on it's not as slippery slippery as last week, and it feels like the lather's staying put a little bit better, which isn't necessarily a positive or negative thing on the rating score. All soaps kind of are judged individually. Uh, but here we go. Coverage, uh, not a lot of suds, but it is uh, the more I lather, uh, there is a color change. You can see here, it's essentially turning the back of my hand white. So, John, so John we have a... We have a, we, we have a we have, why we why have, am I getting questions in the middle of the soap review? I mean, it's not even over yet. <laughs> what, what's this? <laughs> we, I'm sorry. We, I'm, we're getting excited about yeah. it. I'm sorry. I know. I know. I go, go on. I'm, I'm sorry, I love I'm, it. I just love how this is... You know, it's going to... Okay, what's the question? So, so, <laughs> the question is the question actually, is actually from, from one of your, one top, of your fans. top fans. It's, it's actually, actually my mom, mom who's also my mom. And John, do you like liquid soaps or bar soaps better? Oh wow, uh, I, I prefer I prefer liquid soaps, uh, just because the ease and the uh, the cleanliness of keeping them after uh, a bar soap. Once it's done, you either have to have a safe place to keep it, um, or you know it, it just moves all over the place. Liquid soaps are usually in containers, uh, so it doesn't get out of control. So when it's on the hands, the scent of the jasmine is subtle, very subtle. I'd say the scent is like uh, it was a seven out of ten on scent initially. The bar itself, strong 7 out of 10. And right now, I'd say it's like a 2 out of 10. It almost doesn't smell like jasmine. Uh, but good coverage. Uh, remember last week's soap where I said that if I let it dry, I wouldn't feel like I hadn't even had any soap on at all? 
if this dried, I would definitely have, uh, I definitely feel it on my hands, which isn't a bad thing. As I said, that's, that's good. That's, that makes you feel like cleanliness. Now we're putting more water on it and we are getting a lot of bubbles now. So huge coverage. I would say there's some artificial stuff in this to make it bubble up more. The more water I get, the more suds I'm getting. So we're rinsing now. So you'd call it so less, less organic, organic than the soap, than the you, soap had you had last week. I would. I don't know if that's even accurate, but mm. that's how I would describe it. Yeah. Um, yeah. It's definitely stickier. There's more of it on my hands. Um, I would say this is. I said this is why I say it's not a butter, um, because it's definitely a high fat soap of some kind. I, I would say it's an oil based. But I'm at my fourth dunk here. Man, it's pretty clean. It's it's got that little sound. You can't really hear it, but I don't know if you can hear that. A little bit of a, a little bit of a squeaky. A little bit of a yeah, a little squeaky, there. squeaky clean, squeaky yeah, clean. Yeah, absolutely, um, absolutely. So yeah, I mean, it took a little bit more to get off my hands. I think that's probably a positive thing. Uh, the scent's not strong at all. It's essentially gone. I do feel clean and refreshed with it. My hands do feel good. Let's wipe off here and see what happens. I'm just going to do a pat dry because I want to see a little bit of how the performs in the air. Not as slippery as last week's, even after. I mean, not as astringent on my hands. Like I, I felt last week after I used that, uh, that I used the other jasmine soap that was a little more astringency. Like my hands were feeling like they were uh, drying a little bit. Um, oh, man. This is a cleaner product in terms of visually. The scent's not as strong initially, and it's almost non-existent ever uh, after. Last week's soap was very strong scent on the hand, very strong beforehand, and not strong after. Well, the well, word, the word gonna, from... I'm going to go ahead. I'm, I'm working on it. Uh, the, the, uh, the, the, the word the we're, getting we're getting right, getting right now is that the good is news is if the industry goes, goes belly up, up you can always get a future in soap. All right. Is there a soap magazine? <laughs> uh, there is a soap <laughs> section on the Smoke and Tobacco site, uh, but that, that's uh, new construction. <laughs> All right, you guys ready? It's 6-7. Uh, 6-7. Uh, six, six, seven. Six, seven. Six, 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 seven. Seven okay. for the mystery soap. Not as good as last week's. Not as much, uh, not as much coverage. I did think it was more sudsy. Um, but there wasn't as much scent while I was using the soap. Um, I was getting more of the, I, I believe this was definitely commercialized artificial, a little bit more artificial chemicals and some more processed stuff. Um, what I enjoyed about that other soap was that, that the, the, I did enjoy the astringency on my hand where I really feel, felt like my hands were cleaned. I, I don't feel like this did a bad job at that. Um, but I felt, uh, I felt there was a little bit more, uh, a little bit more of a mess. Uh, once the water went on, it didn't come off as easily. And but what? I do like this. I do like the fact the sense there. What did I say? Six seven. Yeah, six seven. Yeah, six seven. It is. What, what what's been a ten? Have you have you had a ten yet? There are no tens. You can't have a ten because if you have a ten, that means there's no other soap that's better than that. There can't be any other soap better. What, what's the highest? Like, oh, oh, we have a seven nine from last week. Was the. Wow. Uh, seven nine. I think. You're, yeah. yeah. You're you're a you're a tough critic. You know, seven yeah. nine is as high as you that's I'm the best. Look, looking for you. I'm gonna find you some soap. I'm gonna find you something. Yeah, yeah. And I'm going over to That's how this started. I was giving tips on places to go. My favorite soaps in uh, baggage claim D15, the third sink from the left. This is a well-known fact. Uh, D15 in the Dallas Fort Worth airport in the Delta terminal. D15, third sink from the right. The first two sinks have different soap. The third sink on the right has uh, has a very nice soap. That's by far my favorite. If I were to give that a score now, I'd probably give that around an 8-9, maybe a 9-1 in that range. Oh, wow. uh, but there is no 10. Once you give a 10, you can't go any higher. Um, so if you give a 10, there's no room to ever go up. That's true. Um, so it's only place to go is down. And we're about positivity. We're about going forward. Yeah. And the soap reviews must get better. But yeah, 6-7 today, mystery soap. Uh, one thing too, man, this dried up real quick. It's not wet at all. Um, it's just, just back to what it was. Um, I have the Jasmine soap outside and I think what I'm doing is just going to leave some of these soaps outside, but yeah, today mystery soap, six, seven, uh, good soap would recommend it. Uh, anything over a five, I'd obviously recommend. Uh, I don't know how to recommend it other than maybe I'll have it on me someday, but yeah, mystery soap six, seven. Well, I just want to quickly announce we are officially in the overtime segment of the show. Uh, for those of you guys who are watching at home, thank you for sticking around. We are in the overtime segment. 
Um, if you would like to send any soap for John to review, you can send it to um, actually. Well, we know what I'll have him send it to me, John, for for discretion of your 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 private address. Uh, you can send it to PO Box <laughs> 190, uh, Boxford, Massachusetts 01921. Again, that's PO Box 190, Boxford, Massachusetts 01921. You can also find the address on smokingtobacco.com. Any kind of soaps you want to send for John to review, you can ship them there. We will we will have them on the show and he will review them. And if you include a note, we'll we'll give you the shout out so you can, you know, be mentioned. But uh, another comment we had is, you know, we, we need the soap brand names next time. So that way if there is a soap you like, you know, people can go out and buy that soap if they want to try it themselves. So that'll definitely be interesting. I have a great soap lined up for next week we are going to be doing liquid soap next week and i'm actually mm. going to be doing a dual liquid soap i have two liquid soaps from the same brand but different scents and different uh, way of performing that i've used these before uh one is a uh, clove and then the other is a lavender so we'll be doing two liquid soaps next week uh but we do need soaps um you know i'm running out of things here i i'm you know i I'll, i'm down to doing any type of soap if you want you know irish spring i can do that if you want safeguard we can do that um, but, dove? Uh, have you done any dove, dove? yet? Oh, I have a good one. dove in the house. We can do dove, dove um, so, but I'm limited to what I have here at the house because I have, I only have five different kinds of soap available. Terrence, you know what we should do? We should get him some, uh, some like real feminine soaps, like from uh, like the body shop or Bath and Body Works. Some some stuff like that, I think, would be interesting for yeah, our female so viewers. Be, yeah, we we, we got to make sure we're inclusive. Yeah, One I, of I think favorite I think, things to do in the world is to go into Bath and Body Works, <laughs> use the exfoliating, the exfoliating thing. Oh, they yeah, got this great. exfoliating sand, and then to wash your hands in there. It's one of the most rewarding things in the world. Uh, so it's not a surprise that I have gotten into this soap, this soap thing, and the passion that I have for it. And I said I'd like to organize the passion a little bit more as we do the blogs. There will be some rating systems and there'll be some standards that we use. Obviously, we've used some of the similar ones, but I would like to get a standard operating procedure uh, for these reviews. And if you're watching, we will have that so we justly rate uh, every soap. So Jared got a lot of comments, herbal essences. So that actually is an interesting concept. Before John loses the hair on the top of his head, maybe we can get, especially in while it's warm out, maybe we can get John to do a, a shampoo review and he can wash the top of his head right here on the show and let us know how, how well his hair comes out. After. That, that's that's an interesting twist to the whole I mean, my only video. question is if I do the review, the point of the review, if we did herbal essences, the herbal essences, does it actually make you moan in the shower would be probably one of the factors that would grow into the rating. I just picture you sitting there with the soap on your head and you go to rinse and you just do the flash dance. I can just see you so doing that. <laughs> All right. I don't know. Well, there you go. I don't, I don't think John <laughs> liked that concept, but something tells me he would do it anyway. Um, but, you know. Yeah, this, you is have serious, some... this is serious business, and I know we joke around about it, and people said, oh, it's tongue-in-cheek. This is serious business, and I take this very serious. So whatever I have to do for the cause um, and for the industry, I will do. Yeah, I mean, you know, one one common thing that non non smokers in general always comment on is the smell. They're like, oh, it smells, and they, yeah, we get it. The cigar smell is not like the most inviting smell. I mean, to us, it doesn't really bother us, but so yeah, I guess the soap does kind of go hand in hand. It, it washes off that smell, so to speak. Um, for the one one comment I do have on it, my I've washed my hands, and there's residue on my hand. I'm having a hard time lighting my lighter. Do you, want to, do you want to check the review because of that? I mean, that's a, you weren't aware of that when you gave the, the, well, the, the I, I gave the it a six, I gave it a six, seven. Um, might've jumped the gun on that score a little yeah, too soon. No, the score is the score. You know, I'm not going back. I'm confident in the score. But that's <laughs> something I'm going to, I'll have to pay attention to because there is uh, some residual on the ends of my fingertips. Yeah. And like John said, there, there is a, there is going to be a section on smoking tobacco.com for it. John's official write-ups on soap reviews that's currently under construction, but hopefully we can get those posted on there soon so that everyone who watches the show can go on there and, and read in detail all about John's soap reviews and get more information on the specific soaps that were used in the reviews as well. So now we are officially into the overtime segment. So Terrence, uh, anything goes pretty much. It doesn't have to be cigars now. Um, a lot of what times we get... Well, a lot of times we get into sports. That's a, that's a that's a common topic, you know. John and I, especially, we you know we really love sports. Um, you know, football has been one we've talked a lot about recently. With you know Cam Newton joining the Patriots, and you know how we feel that's gonna, you know, 
change the way New England football moves forward in the post Tom Brady era. Um, what are your thoughts on that? I'm not sure if you're a football guy or a sports guy, but I, I, I enjoy my uh, New England sports as much as uh, as much as the next guy. I could. There we go. Yeah. Good answer. <laughs> You know, it's, there was a I, I, reason for there was a reason for having Terrence on this show. It was <laughs> mostly it was mostly for selfish reasons. Yeah, we don't want yeah. negativity about Boston sports on the show. That's we can't yeah. we can't have that. There's a lot of haters out there that you know may be great in terms of cigars, but would have very very uh, unflattering opinions that would probably reduce you know their image in our eyes if we you know heard them talk about Boston sports. So, what's your take on Cam Newton? What's what's your honest, unbiased opinion? He's going to wear a Patriots uniform. He's calling the shots at quarterback this year. Well, we'll see if he's calling any shots. At the, I mean, they got uh, right, yes, Daniel but... I'm, I'm the offensive coordinator. But, I mean, I think they're going to use him for uh, for a year. They got a good deal on him, and uh, they're going to use him for a year. Um, and then he's probably going to, going to go away. I, I don't think he's a long-term you know, solution to anything. Uh, it gives him the opportunity potentially to you know, do wildcat offense formations and and that kind of thing and he's a very talented guy he's, he's gonna he's gonna be i think successful but i, I don't know if they're like this is a, the guy we're gonna have in four years from now or five years i think that he's basically there is a short-term thing if he has a great year he, you know he'll be able to you know write his own check and uh the patriots will probably be fine with that yeah i don't know what do you guys think well, we've talked about it. You know, it's it's going to be interesting. It, it'll be fun to watch. It'll be interesting to see how it unfolds and, and, and what exactly comes out of this situation. You know, uh, granted that he, you know, stays healthy and there's no injuries, whether even before the season starts or even during, um, you know, how, how he meshes with, you know, the team and the Patriot way, so to speak, which, you know, we and John have talked about. And we, we think that, you know, he'll, he'll most likely he'll form to the Patriot way, which is a huge thing. I mean, it, the Patriots as a team, you know, regardless of who's on the team, it's it's a very unique atmosphere. You know, it's their way or no way, you know, and Belichick you know, being the coach that he is runs a very tight ship. So, you know, granted that he stays healthy, he plays the Patriot way, you know, he's set up for success, you know, go out there and, you know, work with this coach, work with, you know, Josh McDaniels and, 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 you know, work the playbook and, and put some good stuff together. It'll be fun to see, you know, hopefully, yeah, we have a great season, got some, got some good stuff out of them. I don't know if it's a playoff run. I mean, I know we're talking about the Patriots, but obviously there's a, there's a, there's a lot of new variables here. Um, it'll be interesting to see how far they do go with the Cam Newton offense and what exactly comes out of it. I'm predicting a good season, um, I think John mentioned before he he had a prediction. Uh, John, I think you want. I wanted to say you said what was your prediction on the out the the uh, the Patriots record by the end of the season? I, I haven't made a prediction on that, but I think they're going to win the Super Bowl. You think so? <laughs> you really do. So so there's a couple. There's there's a many things here. First of all, um, I'm a personally a big Cam Newton enthusiast. Um, I, I had the luxury of spending some time with him over a cigar in a more uh, laid back environment where he got to just be Cam, you know, himself. Um, and we shared cigars. He's a cigar smoker. He has a cigar place down in uh, Atlanta with his brother, CJ. Um, and I got to spend some time with him. And it was really interesting to talk to him. And this was right when he was dealing with the foot injury situation from last year. And um, it was some unique conversations. And I won't get into the discussions we we had because I, I called I called this Patriots thing in January. I said, Cam Newton is going to be wearing a Patriots jersey. Now, a lot of things looked like it wasn't going to go that way. This current situation uh, where we're in with COVID played into this a little bit because in terms of the NFL, there's a lot of uncertainty. There aren't many teams that needed a starting quarterback because there was a lot of money invested in players, young players and whatnot. There was two teams that were going to need a quarterback. One the Tampa Bay Buccaneers, which I think would have been a perfect fit for Cam Newton as well, or wherever Tom Brady just left. <laughs> right. So they're going to be in need of that quarterback because Jared Sinem's not the answer to that, qu- to, to that question right now. Maybe he is in the future. But there's a few things that play into that. One, Cam's coming off an injury. People said, oh, he's injury prone. He's really not injury prone. He's one of the toughest, most durable players in the NFL. He's just been injured the last two seasons in some part of it. So you've got a guy who's in his prime who's a freak of an athlete. I don't know if you've ever been around him, 
he's legit six, five, nearly six, six, two fifty five. He's huge. He's a massive human being and he can run. He can do all these things. If you watch his workout videos online, he's obviously not injured, but obviously that could change, but anyone's liable to get injured. So there's a couple things that Cam brings to the table. One, he's going to be physically healthy coming into the season. A hundred percent. If he can't beat Jared Stidham, where he won the, where he won the MVP, he was the best player in the league four years ago. The best. If he can't beat Jared Stidham out for the starting job, then he doesn't belong in the NFL, which that's going to happen. He's going to be the starter. That's the intention. You can see how he's being marketed. That's his intention to come in there. So one, he's got that going for him. He was the best player four years ago in the league. He's still in his prime. He's 31 years old. Two, you take an athlete of that caliber and you put a chip on their shoulder where he thinks he's got something to prove. That's why he signed a contract because if he has a year this year, it right gives back. him an opportunity yeah. to play with, by the way, the best player on the New England Patriots the last two seasons is still on the team, which I've just been on the record of saying. Stephon Gilmore is by far the best player on the Patriots. That defense was good enough to give them a 12-4 and four record last year. All right? Now, take that stuff apart. you got the chip on the shoulder. you got the guy coming in healthy. He's got stuff to prove. He's showing he wants to play because he's taking that discount. He's taking the league minimum. If this guy has a great season... He's not staying in New England because he's going to sign a five-year, $200 million contract with somebody. This is what it is. He's smart. He gets it. And he's young enough to show it. And it's also shown that he wants to win. And it's not just about the money because he has been paid very well, too. But he's staring down big contract if this goes well. Next, Brady's the GOAT, hands down. If you watched that offense last year, here's some issues that happened. They didn't have good blocking with the tight ends. The tight ends were trash. They didn't block at all. When you don't have tight ends blocking, especially in the Patriots, that's one less person, one more person that's going to be in the backfield. Brady's not mobile at all. Now, he moves around the pocket very well and has good pocket presence, but if you're not running accurate routes and you have these young athletic receivers who aren't in proper timing with Tom Brady, Brady's going to throw the ball at your feet and get rid of the ball because he's not going to get hit. He doesn't want to get hit because he understands that he's hit. Oh, what was that, John? Oh, it was like it was like a thunderstorm or something in the background. Oh. So Brady snaps back, takes the ball. He gets back two seconds. Somebody's out of line, doesn't run the right route. He either throws it off to Edelman or he throws it down right. to James. They have a good play. Or the, the defense is set up right and they don't have any they don't have anything good. The running game sucked last year because of that, because they could just send there was always people in the backfield because they couldn't block. The tight ends last year didn't even try to block. When they tried, they couldn't. Because they were small, undersized, not good blockers. So that's improved. However, even if it hasn't improved, that team last year and this team this year, that offense will be in a better position with a player like Cam Newton than they would with a Tom Brady, which was obvious. Because Tom Brady couldn't figure out these guys, and people are saying, well, these receivers couldn't figure out how's it going to work with Cam Newton. When Cam Newton steps back and a receiver doesn't run a route right, and there's a guy in front of him that's coming at him, first thing Cam Newton's going to do is run away from the guy, which then turns it into more of a playground-type offense where that receiver who's running around doesn't necessarily have to run the perfect route. All Cam Newton has to do is reposition himself, give himself some more time where he can either run and take off. And I'm not saying he's like Patrick Mahomes or he's as fast as those guys. But when he takes off, the last person you want running into you is Cam Newton. He's yeah, bigger he's a big than man. Yeah. <laughs> so he's going to be able to move. He's more mobile. He's got a very strong arm. Um, he's going to have extra time. So a lot of those plays that we looked at as Patriots fans and we were like, man, this receiver didn't run the right route. It was too quick. We need more time. We need more of this. One extra, if Cam Newton can get one extra second and that receiver can get one more second wide open, you look at guys like Nikhil Harry. The guy's a stud athlete. He's learning the offense. You look at a guy like Muhammad Sanu. He's a massive human being, a big guy, runs fast, strong. You got that other guy, Harris, big athlete, strong, fast, athletic. But they just were running shitty routes because they just don't know how to run the routes they need. So with Brady, they're off and you run a shitty route. Now I'm pissed at you. And I'm going to throw it to the ground because I'm not going to get sacked. And then we have three and outs. Cam Newton's going to take that to another level where he's going to buy an extra second. And all you need, it's a game of inches. All you need is two or three extra plays in every game 
even the games the Patriots lost, if they had, I mean, if they only got those two or three extra plays, Cam's going to be able to get those two or three extra plays. And that defense is good enough that if you give him two or three extra plays, you're not going to beat him. So all he needs to do is that he needs to manage the offense. And I will say one thing from the conversation I had with him, he understands that the Patriots and everyone in the NFL understands this as it may not be the funnest system. Winning's fun. And the way they do it, somebody has to sacrifice in that system. Like you look at Cleveland Browns. The reason the Cleveland Browns don't work is because Jarvis Landry has got a contract that says if he catches a certain number of balls, he's going to get the ball. Baker Mayfield, throw me the ball, bro. I want my extra two mil. Odell Beckham's not going to say, hey, I don't want to catch the ball. It's about him. He wants attention. He's a stud athlete. He should get the attention, right? So you have all these players, their best tight end in Joku left the team because he wanted to go somewhere else because it's just so ridiculous. Cam Newton just made the ultimate sacrifice. He made a sacrifice bigger than Tom Brady ever made with restructuring of his contract. A MVP of the league in his prime just took the league minimum. And I don't care about all the, the extra stuff that he can get. Yeah. yeah. Bottom took, line is what's your chance. Yeah. He just took the league minimum in his prime to show what's going on. Now, next level. And this is my last point. Cam Newton aside. What's the, there's egos in this. Brady's got an ego. Everyone's got egos. Belichick's got a massive ego. He has a boat that says nine championships on the back of it. All right. What's the biggest thing for Bill Belichick? It's about winning, but it's also about his pride. So at the beginning of this free agency, I'm not going to sign Cam Newton at $20 million. Why would I do that? Um, that's a waste of money. This doesn't make sense. But I'd love a guy like Cam Newton if he comes in at a discount. And my guys are like, hey, we can get this guy. He wants to play. There's nowhere else for him to go. This is his best chance to win. He wants to show what he wants to do. He's willing to take the league minimum. Let's bring him in, take a chance. The best thing Bill Belichick can do for his ego is to try to put this team. And by the way, he always loves defense. And he's got his best defense he's ever had for two straight years, and he's got it back again this year. It's the best Patriots defense they ever had. Last year, it was the best team, they ever, best defensive team they ever had. Even if they're top 10 next year, it's good enough. The best thing for, for Belichick, for his ego, would be to win a Super Bowl without Tom Brady the very next year he left. And if you don't think that's in his head, and you also don't think it's in Brady's, that the best thing for me to do is win it the very next year, it's, you're wrong. That's in their minds. That's their goal. That's Belichick's goal. And Cam Newton just made the biggest sacrifice anybody's made for Patriot Nation by taking the league minimum. He could have waited and sat around and maybe found a team that decided two weeks in a weekend that they didn't want somebody and this guy wasn't going to work out or wait for injuries. Cam Newton made the sacrifice, and that's really what the Patriot way is about. And he did sacrifice. I think he's going to be great. I think the opportunity for him there is huge. And that defense is going to make him look so good. Because all they need is a couple extra plays. Well said. I think that's well said. Thank yeah, you, one of the, one of the things we talked about in the Ashles this week, we, we kind of touched on that. And and Ben, the producer, you know, he, he said Belichick. It, for those who don't know, Ben is um, for you guys who watch that show, and uh, Ben actually works at WEI Radio in Boston. Uh, and and he said one of the biggest points, and kind of what, what John you were saying is Belichick is a legacy guy. He he cares about his legacy, and I think right now, for, like you were saying, he thinks of it like you look at the Brady Belichick era, the twenty years they spent together, and everything that they accomplished, which is great. You know, we won't, we'll never see it again. But he's also thinking like, I don't want people to think of me as well. You know, Bill. You know, Bill Belichick was great, but he had Tom Brady. It's Bill Belichick was a good coach because no matter who he had, he brought to a Super Bowl championship. So yeah, I think for him, it's the, it's it's that pressure, it's that it's that race in his mind, so to speak. If but, but Brady you know, is part of his legacy already. But you got to look at it; there are different parts of their lives too in the same game. Belichick's legacy is just this. This is the end of his legacy. So he has he has all these things to accomplish that he has accomplished with Brady, and it's part of what he's done. But right. this next step is I have you know. This is what I am. I'm this coach. So the only, this is my only legacy. When Brady's done playing, he has an option to make his legacy and other things too. So he has a sports legacy. Belichick's life is, is only this, and it's only been Brady's. Uh, but that changes your mentality, uh, the way you look at it. They both are the same type of person. They're both control freaks. They're both nuts. And they both want the same thing, but they all have different ways of accomplishing it. 
And for Belichick's to accomplish winning again and continuing, it has to be with somebody else. Uh, because the only reason Brady wasn't gone two years ago is because they won the Super Bowl two years ago. Uh, I, I think this is the icing on the cake for Belichick. Because, mm-hmm. And again, he's already the, the best coach of all time. Right? There's no question about that. But the only excuse, like we were you know, saying, is that, oh, well, he had Brady and Brady's the go-to. And, and if you win the next year without him, I think that that puts any argument into the old grave. And so there's just nothing left immediately, immediately, right? Yeah. yeah, Like immediately, if (laughs) he does it immediately, immediately the next year, and then you can say, Oh, well, you know, a guy like, well, it's because he had Cam Newton because he was the MVP. Well, you know, yeah, that maybe it is, but like, no, you, you can't make that argument anymore. And, and I don't think, I don't think Belichick wants to to delete anything that has to do with Brady. He just wants to take it to another level where it said, yeah, I did do this with Brady six times yeah and then i did it one time without him yeah and while, while he, by the way while he was playing i still love him he's like my kid he's like he's like family to me great guy he's always well, he's going to be connected to who i am but i love you so much like my my fiercest competitors are the people that i've been closest with you know and have been part of my successes uh you know and you look at that on, on that high level where it's really competitive is yeah absolutely he, he wants to win it and he wants to win it this year and when the Cam Newton thing came up, if you were, they had to have talked at some point in time. It was obviously out there what Cam's mentality was lining up with theirs. So these people, like, if he's going to fit the, and if Cam's a good guy, he made he's made mistakes when he was younger. He's a grown man. You don't hear a lot of crap about him. People are like, oh, he might have a kid out of wedlock or something. I don't even know yeah. if that's yeah. true. What? If he does, who cares? But like, what, like Tom yeah. Brady's got one too, and all these other people. Like, there's tons of these situations. So you're going to yeah. judge cares? a moral compass off the guy's performance. He's a mature adult. He's not doing anything wrong. He's got his own business. He's a, this is my He's a grown man. Cam, Newton, Cam Newton's a grown ass man. He is a man and he is a gifted athlete. And if he stays healthy and if anyone stays healthy, same thing, Patrick Mahomes, you name it. If anyone stays healthy in the NFL with his skill set, it's going to be a huge improvement. I'll take a 31 year old Cam Newton over 42 year old Tom Brady right now. Every time. Yeah, and again, Brady, as I always say, is probably the greatest human who ever lived. That said, he did not look very good last year. He he didn't look good, man. He he, he was missing he was missing passes. He didn't throw his uh, he used not to miss. His arm strength was not what it used to be. He just he didn't look he he looked a lot more human. I mean, again, he, for that part of that was they like you said, John, they didn't have the tight ends blocking for him, and he and he didn't have some of the weapons he'd had in the past. But he he just didn't look that that good he's forced to be he was forced to look human yeah cam newton at 31 can look like superman just four years ago we were all doing this and now we're like now cam's a liability or something give me a no, break no, no, no that's ridiculous Superman yeah. two years ago yeah. he was patrick mahomes i'm not going to say on steroids because he's not on steroids but he's huge he was a he's a 6'5 255 pound patrick mahomes yeah, it took Carolina to a Super Bowl. I mean, he's, he's, uh, yeah, you know, people just, they, their memories are short. And so, like, yeah, he's been injured the last couple of years. And so, like you said, he's not, he's not been injury prone. He's been, he's had a couple injuries the last two years, but that's his whole career for the most part. He was, he's been healthy and, and he looks healthy now. And, uh, yeah, I think he was a steal, man. I think that that is, uh, him and Randy Moss are the two great steals, I think, of, uh, in Patriots history. I- yeah, I think so too. And and maybe I I put number three, probably Corey Dillon was a really yeah, good Corey one. Yeah, Corey Dillon was a great yeah, that was a good one too. I might even I might do number three. I might even say Darrell Revis too at, at number three. Um and if, if Cam right now I put Darrell Revis at number two, Corey Dillon three. Uh Cam Newton, if this shows up well and they and they get they win a Super Bowl on it, I think that's more substantial than any of that, uh, you know, than any of those. If he can come out and win a Super Bowl, um and no, he if, put, he wins, if they win the Super Bowl, he's, he's by far. It's he's the, the biggest deal ever because he yeah. will, and, and people are going to want to keep him. And you know what? At that point, maybe you make that decision where you're going to pay the guy the money. Um, if he did that and he, he does that type of thing. Uh, but even if he just makes the playoffs and they have a good season, he's signing a $35 million a year contract. He'd be the second, third highest pay, paid player in the league. Yeah. Yeah. If, and if they, if they win the you know who's going to sign him? The Dallas frigging Cowboys. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Where great players go to die. No, uh, <laughs> exactly. No, he, he, well, yeah. If, if they win the Super Bowl, I think they would consider consider signing him 
for yeah. for a longer term. I think that they, were, but that would be, I think, I think it would be they'd have to win it, and he would have have to really perform well in the system. It couldn't have been just, you know, yeah. it, it, he he made he made you know some some plays and important moments and things like that. I think he's going to have to really mesh in the system for them to say, okay, well, because the Patriots don't like paying that much money for man. They don't, I mean, they like, cause if they win the Super Bowl, they're going to have to pay him a ton of money, man. They're going to have to pay a yeah. lot. And so, and, and, and the fan base will, will almost somewhat demand it, but it's a win, 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 win for Cam Newton. And it's a win, win for the Patriots. And I'm excited, man. I, I was sad when Brady left. I knew the writing was on the wall. I'm glad we've got Tampa to watch and I can follow Brady's career continues. So I'm glad he's still playing football. But after he left, I was like, you know, I, I, I want Cam here. I'm like, he's not coming because they're not going to pay him. And then the coronavirus hit and I'm like, this changes everything. And I'm like, because he can't get out and work out with people. Um, the Carolina Panthers kind of ran him along a little bit at the end, in my opinion. Yeah. They didn't quite release him. And I'm like, this is, I'm like, this might actually happen. And then when it popped up on my phone with ESPN, I was like, yes. Yeah, I was you like, were saying yes, about in January. You were, you, were talking, yes. you were talking about him coming in January. So it was a big thing. And I said, I haven't been, I, I'm, I'm a high level of excitement. I, and by the way, I'm excited for the Patriots. I'm excited to see a different look. I'm excited to watch that team be different for the first time in 20 years. I, you know, I, I'd like to see a Patriots Tampa Super Bowl and the Patriots win. That's what I'd like to see, ideally. Yeah, same. Like the like the ultimate showdown. So here's a question though, and because I, I know you're, you're, I've referred to you as the Gronk of the cigar industry, and so there's obviously some emotional connection there. But I think they've made a way too big a deal out of him. He's been out for a couple of years. He, I, you know, I don't. I think people again, they're thinking of him back. He looked his last year. He looked like half the human he was a couple of years before that. I don't know how, how successful he's going to be there. I don't know. So he, he left the game because he physically, I don't know if you listened to him and part of it was the CBD thing he was doing, but he left the game because he physically felt bad. Yeah, no, I know. I know. Like he felt bad after he was in football, beat you up. And a guy like Gronk's really unique because Gronk's a big human being. He's like six, seven, um, but he's like 260 pounds. Um, he's, he's tall, he's big, he's lanky. Um, when, when Gronk catches the ball, when he gets hit, he gets hit hard and he doesn't look that bad because he's a big guy and he's tall or whatever, but he takes hits. He's plus physically it, getting plus hit. little D- DBs coming and hitting you in your yeah. knees and everything, your knees, your legs, the type of hits yeah. he takes. You know, for example, I had a good friend that played in the league and my good friend was 285 pounds. Now he wasn't a pass catching tight end. He was a blocking tight end, but when he did catch the ball, he was delivering the hit. When Gronk caught the ball, he was getting hit. He wasn't running over people. He was stiff arming them. He was coming off of tackles. He was getting hit late. Every time he got hit the last year, he thought he was going to break a leg. He had a bad knee. Now, I think he's recovered some, but he's not, um, his wingspan's crazy. You know, his, his arm's like 20 feet across. But he's going to be, I think they'd be smart. They're making a big deal about him coming back because he is a big deal because he's uncoverable. A linebacker can't cover him because he's too tall, too fast. And even if he's not fast enough, he's too tall for him. His hands are too high. Uh, uh, all the DBs are smaller than him. There's no, you know, there's no uh, Earl Thomases in the league like that really anymore. Uh, the DBs are smaller. I mean, Dev, the best, one of the best safeties in the league is Devin McCourty, and he's like 205 pounds. You know, a Gronk against him, he's not going to cover him. So situationally, it'll be used great. I, I think he maybe plays 40, 50, maybe 60 at the most percent of the snaps. Uh, he won't be in there all the time. Um, you know, red zone, he'll be in there a lot. He'll be a good distraction. He will make some good plays because he's going to catch the ball, but it won't be like four years ago uh, where he's taking the taking the team on his sleeve and doing that. It'll be more like what it was the last Super Bowl they won uh, where you throw a pass to him and it's just him and you give him that one shot. Uh, yeah. You know, and he's going to he's gonna have to convert. His conversion rate's going to have to be higher because he's going to have less opportunities. Um, and that's not uh, a knock on him, but... To say, oh, Gronk's there, so now it's going to be a big difference. I mean, it's a different Gronk. Now, Gronk's still Gronk, but he's not Travis Kelsey anymore. Yeah, exactly. That's, that was my point. Uh, we're on the same page. I just wanted to see your thoughts. Well, you guys, we are unfortunately at the end of the show. Um, you know, it's been a great chat, great time. And, um, oops, sorry, forgot my microphone was put away. Um, yeah, so we are, we are at the end of the show, unfortunately. And uh, it, great time. Great talk. Yeah, soap review, some football talk, a lot of cigar talk. Terrence, 
thank you for joining us. No, thank um, you guys. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, and before but before we close out, you know, I wanted to, you know, put our last thoughts and statements in there. So, Terrence, if there's anything you wanted to say before we uh, end the show. Yeah, th- thank you for having me. Thank you to everyone out there listening. And uh, please, you know, make sure to follow us on Agonorsa Leaf, uh, Instagram, Facebook. And we got a, a group, Agonorsa Acolypse, on Facebook. So come and join. And, and uh, I appreciate you guys having me. And this was a, a lot of fun. I had a great time. Thank you for joining us, Terrence. Uh, John, any closing remarks? Hacking Gourmet news? Yeah, we had uh, our first episode officially as Hacking Gourmet on Monday. That was Chef Jam with my friend Chef KB from KB Cuisines um, in Florida, a good friend of mine, uh, the chef to the stars. He was a private chef uh, for several NBA players and has his own business now, uh, which has been challenging with coronavirus. That shut down a lot of private functions that he does, but he's holding strong. So he was a great guest, and we'll be back live on uh, July 27th um, for a new episode. We're testing some new things out there. Our, our viewers, uh, well, we anticipate it being small, but our viewers will have an opportunity uh, to take part in a private uh, Zoom lounge while our show is going on, where they'll be cooking with me in real time. Uh, so we'll be posting that menu over the next few days over the weekend um, as we get ready for uh, July 27th at Hacking Gourmet. Yeah, that'll be it. that'll be quite the show. Um, good stuff going on over there, Hacking Gourmet. Just wanted to, you know, give a little love to those guys and, and you obviously on that on that program so great stuff um terrence the the supreme leaf i'm almost at the end here fantastic cigar really oh. honest to god really great um it stayed nice and consistent nice and smooth ramped it you know ramped up a little bit at the end here but uh i enjoyed it though it, it was fantastic and I'm, I'm excited to get more of these these were if i could find them uh, they they this this was fantastic so job well done at agonorsa uh and i look forward to uh, all all the new releases you have coming out and i gotta get and, and i i'm gonna get on that torch too it looks like an awesome smoke i can't wait to try that i'd love to hear your thoughts yeah so absolutely. i think next week also, too, I think next week we're uh, we're going to be uh, we're going to be broadcasting live from all of us from the tobacco estate. Yes, um, so Carney will be uh, will be here with us in person. So we will be doing a show all together. Uh, I'm really excited about that. Um, it'll be the first time it's been done on the Smoking Tobacco Show. So yeah, so stay tuned for that. It'll be a special episode. Um, we also have uh, we have a a special guest joining us next week as well, John. Um, from the Cigar Rights of America. And that is um, um, Glenn Loop. Excellent. Excellent. Yeah, Glenn. excited. Yeah, yeah. So it's, it's, it's going gonna, it's gonna to be a good episode. We're excited to, to get into all things Cigar Rights of America and everything that goes on in the industry, you know, on that side of it. So that's definitely going to be a great show. So stick around for that. Also, follow us on Instagram, Facebook, YouTube, all that fun stuff. You can also now check out the Smoke and Tobacco Show on Podbean, Apple Podcasts, and everywhere the podcasts are found. We are out on the waves now everywhere, and we are going to close this out. So we will see you guys again next week. Thank you for watching. Take care, guys.